Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shat, episode 145, featuring the third part of my interview with the Fat Man, aka George Sanger. In this part of the interview, we talk about his early days, how he came up with his persona of the Fat Man, and uh, how the how is uh, the job has changed over the years with the technology and how it stayed the same. Got a lot of great stuff to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. George Sanger. I'm kind of ready to step into a time machine and and go back to the early 80s and you know hear about this project called Thin Ice. I actually looked this up on YouTube because I wanted to hear the music and I you know I have to say I was it was it's a very impressive melody and I'm just keep thinking you know, this is like 1980 this is in television 1983 I mean this is <laughs> how'd you do that I mean how did you get to the position where uh, you you were making a game I mean a a piece of music for the uh, for an in television. I wasn't, I had no self-confidence. Um, I had just graduated from Occidental College a few years ahead of Barack Obama, really. You know, he was there a couple of years uh, after after me. Um, and uh, the people who went to that school were real heavy hitters, especially in the music department. But I wasn't that good of a musician. Um, I got into the music department because I wanted our band to make it and I wanted to be a dedicated band member. So I'm in here with all these guys who can sight read and play all these instruments and conduct and read entire scores and hear the music in their head. I couldn't do any of that. So, But I liked playing video games. I went and talked to uh, Dave Warhol, who was my brother's roommate in college. And I said, you're, in, you're doing video games? He said, yeah. I said, I want to get into that. I said, I will take your trash out for free, you know, whatever you want. And he says, well, you're a musician, aren't you? I said, yeah. And he says, well, write me some music. I need uh, penguins ice skating. Said, okay. So I, I, uh, I got out my reel-to-reel -reel recorder. And uh, they went, do dee do dee do dee do dee do dee do dee on one track. And, and uh, you know, dun, 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 you know, I tried, you know, I punched in multi-track. I punched in every little phrase. And once I got it to where it kind of sounded pretty good, uh, I went back and translated it into, into written manuscript, which was, it was laborious for me. Just two voices. But uh, I gave that to him on manuscript paper, and he liked it. And he, being a trombone player, uh, translated, and, and very musical guy, uh, translated it into code and put it in the game. And that's that's how I got into it. Uh, I can't really recommend that path to anyone anymore. <laughs> I really, I don't know, you know, if if Dave Warhol is still accepting manuscripts. <laughs> you actually interviewed him uh, a few years ago at GDC. Yeah. Oh, so were you interested purely in the music side of games, or were you also sort of curious about the technology and the you know the engineering of it all? Uh, not the engineering, the design. And if the engineering was required to do the design, yeah. And I thought that I maybe had what it took to be a game designer too. But as soon as I the second game I worked on was with Paul Edelstein, uh, that was uh, Capture the Flag for Atari. Which, which is the sequel to Way Out. It's like one of the first first-person games. Uh, John Romero was real big on that one. He said it was a big inspiration to him. So I'm working on this first-person game. I do the music. It's kind of an interactive soundtrack. It's in 1984, maybe. And uh, there's nothing else to do, so Edelstein teaches me fourth. Um, and so, and he sets me up with a little kit, and he... Uh, you know, a, a bunch of definitions. That's how you program in for it. Uh, and uh, I was to try to design a game in fourth. And really, I I just, I made some puzzles that were kind of neat. And Paul liked them and he was very tolerant. But it was nice to find out early that, no, I'm not, I'm not that guy, you know. But, uh, uh, but that and that get loaded me up with respect for the people who really are that guy. One person you you really don't think of as that guy, but he is, is Ralph Bear. And that guy is that guy. I mean, he invented the idea of video games. And but on top of that, you know, he came up with Simon, and that is an 
elegant freaking game. I am sorry. That is an elegant game. And this guy, he's still out there. He's about 90. And uh, he's he's got a soldering station. I set up my soldering station to be like his. I, I got to spend the night at his house one night. And we hung out. It was really nice. And uh, And what he does is he goes down into his little room and he solders LEDs to to uh to chips and he makes himself little games like like he makes himself a reaction tester you know where he has to shoot a gun at something before the second light goes off or you know he has to he has to touch a button in reaction to something else or he has to aim something he's always designing these like one bit games and that is the core you know that sort of attention to elemental game design is something that I really respect. And I'm sorry, I just could never get it up to respect the plots of the games. And I, I see that as my own deficiency because I know it affects people emotionally, especially something like Portal, you know, and uh, the Deus Ex kind of things that, People really care about that stuff. That was never... I went to USC film school. I have this idea of what a plot is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's different. And I, 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 I get picky and the voices in my head get too loud and, and I just can't enjoy that. But I can enjoy, you know, basketball. Uh, or, oh, you know, the, the racing, the three LED racing games from Mattel, stuff like that. Which, oh, I guess it turns out that a bunch of that stuff was done by your... Uh, by our guy, Peter. Peter Oliphant. Yeah, Peter Oliphant, yeah. You know, he called me up one day and said, George, I cannot... He says, he says, Fat Man, I am so frustrated. you got to help me. I said, well, what is it? He said, how did you get people to start calling you the Fat Man? Said, Why? <laughs> he says, I want people to call me Peteroid. And he, he put out that his name was Peteroid. And he just couldn't get people to call him that. And it was frustrating. He called me up for advice. Isn't that great? <laughs> so what'd you tell him? No, I don't know. I don't remember what I told him. I mean, secretly, I thought that's not really that great of a name, but who am I to say? And and uh, are you sure you want to be called that? And, you know, I, I told him it was a t double-edged sword. I mean, if people start calling you Peteroid, if you, if you're, you got to be careful what you want, because you might get it. You might not like it. You know, if you're going to put yourself out there as a cartoon, people might start thinking of you as a cartoon. So do you have regrets about uh, the fat man? You wish you hadn't uh, started it? I have, but I think the fat man, I think the fat man, the character, is a successful part of my life. And even though I think I lost a lot of jobs on account of having that character, now looking back on it, because it's, it's more complicated, it's not really straightforward, for the consumer, you know, it's not really what they want. And I'd say the only part of it that I really regret is that I don't think it really served people as well as it could have. It was a little bit more for me and a little bit less for them. And if I could have refined that somewhat and made it more exciting for other people to be part of the fat man or to know about the fat man, I think I would have changed that. Um, but uh, as far as like what jobs I did get on account of it and what I got away with and uh, people who heard about the fat man and said, oh, my God, I don't even believe does he really exist? You know, I really enjoyed that part of it and I still do. And one thing I was uh, got a question here somewhere about it, but I'll just try to improvise. You know, so I was thinking about the, the fat man and the, the suits and everything. And I was thinking, you know, this would not be unusual at, at all in like the rock and roll world and you see somebody like David Bowie and all of his characters and so on. So it works great for them. You know, it's part of their, uh, their performance. It's very, it's delightful, you know, to use a, uh, word that you seem to like and me too. Uh, so why is it considered so bizarre and strange for a game musician? I don't know. And that's a really mysterious thing to me. Uh, I thought that we would be more like hippies. I thought we would be a more artistic crowd, you know, I, but somehow we went right from primitive, uh, primitive nerds to Hollywood sellouts 
with a lot of beautiful things in between. But we didn't go through Woodstock, and I really thought we did. We would, and and it, to some extent we sort of did. But we went through corporate Woodstocks, you know, like like Mario is a beautiful thing, and and uh, and Katamari Damashi, you know, they're they're these. Grim Fandango, you know, there are these great abstract pieces that are out there, but we, I don't know where the, uh, when a Tempest indicated to me that there was something on the horizon that never quite showed up, you know, and Missile Command, the, the impressionism of those things isn't what caught on. The warlike part of it, and the uh, need for accuracy and stuff like that, that caught on. But uh, I don't know. What do you think? I, I mean, I wasn't really sure that it was that weird until years into it, and I'm looking back and I'm going, "What? Why do nobody gets it? Do they? Oh my gosh, nobody gets yeah. it." Well, I, to me, it's just really bizarre, and I think you really kind of hit on it. You know, the when we're talking about the sort of corporatization of it all and getting away from that sort of uh, artistic, creative sort of uh, aspect of it. I mean, I've you know I had to talk to other game audio uh, musicians too, and they you know one of the things that I remember they talked about was how you know you take a Jimi Hendrix. Uh, one of his songs, and you can listen to it now, and nobody's going to listen to that and think, wow, that's really obsolete. <laughs> or, that's so primitive. You know, but a lot of their music, on the other hand, they felt that way. You know, like they were actually embarrassed to to, uh, to hear some of their early uh, compositions. Um, to, I mean, to me, it's not about old, obsolete stuff and new. It's, you know, it was either artistically done or it wasn't, right? Yeah. I, I was never uh, ashamed of my 8-bit stuff. Uh, people don't get it sometimes. You know, they say, well, this stuff sounds better because it's on an orchestra. You know, it sounds better than your stuff. You know, give me some new stuff. I'm like, listen to the composition. It's, you know, you, you'll find, uh, I think the, the Maniac Mansion stuff, Evil Dr. Fred, you know, if you find that on YouTube and, and play it for people, you'll see it's a, it's a really complicated little piece. Uh, I think, you know, I'm not saying Mozart would have been proud to write it, but maybe maybe Bach maybe Bach would have you know <laughs> Danny Elfman I don't know if you, if you only have two or three voices available to you there's only so much you can do and uh, and I think that this expresses a lot with that, those few voices I'm really proud of it um, even if people don't get it but but you're saying the musicians yeah they found themselves with things that were obsolete that's uh, that's too bad that's too bad no, I, I think that if you listen to old recordings, too, of great, great musicians, uh, I don't think Little Richard looks back and says, oh, if only I'd had higher fidelity on which to record. You know, I think that he, he says, man, I was, you know, listen to me, I'm the king. You know, he doesn't care about the recording quality. He's excited about getting music out there. Um... I want to see people excited about getting games out there. I want to see people playing the games that, that reflect that. You know, I, want, I don't want to see them picking out sequels to games about movies that really didn't come out that well in the first place, but they feel they have to buy it because their friends are all going to have it. You know, it, it, uh, Smash Brothers and Brawl, yeah, those are great games. Get the sequel. Anything that comes out of the Smash Brothers series you better buy it because they have earned your loyalty but you know if you're hoping that uh daikatana 2 is going to be better than... <laughs> don't do it <laughs> oh poor romero <laughs> uh, yeah I, well that's you know what i have no idea what the quality of daikatana i've never played it i've never looked at it but i do know one thing if you say the word daikatana among gamers you'll get a laugh <laughs> that's all I'm doing. Cheap laugh at the expense of my friend. Sorry, John. Sorry. I wanted, you know, this is a sort of big sweeping question here, but, you know, I was thinking you'd, you'd be the perfect person to ask this, you know, with the, the all the experience going all the way back to 1983. And what I was wondering is how has the 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 different ways that are available to make a game a music composition, you know, nowadays, I guess, you know, everybody's just using things like Pro Tools, uh, maybe some people using GarageBand. I'm just sort of wondering, what is the the effect on the creativity? Is there any kind of effect on the, the creativity of making uh, music when you shift from um, all these various tools? 
That's that's a really good question, but you got to you you, you got to look at it with some perspective. Um, I can make music a number of ways, almost any way. Um, and certain ways have certain sounds and they have certain speeds and they have certain amounts of care that you can put into them and can't put into them. And some of them work well for some styles and don't work well for other styles. Um, if you're doing Dixieland on all keyboards and sequencers, there's a problem, you know, <laughs> unless you're in a hurry and a really limited budget. But, uh, you know, I should play you some of the Brat Pack stuff that I did with, you know, I had to buy a, I, I bought a saxophone and learned it and then used the modern tools to pitch shift around and, and, and fix my tuning so that I would sound like I could play sax. And then I put in trumpet, which I can play, but I can't play high. So I used the tools to octave it up. It sounds very cool. Um, so remind me at the end, I'll, I'll send you a file or, or something. Um, but my friend Ron Jones does the orchestral score for Family Guy. And what he does is he sits down at a piano with a piece of paper and writes little circles and dots. And then he gives that to somebody else and says, make a MIDI score of that so that the producers can hear it. If they like it, we'll take it to the orchestra. So, um, the technology is... It's just like asking a painter to what extent has the technology influenced what you do. If, if he's painting, it, it maybe hasn't influenced him that much. If, he's, if he decides he wants to do something on the, on the computer, maybe it has. If, if, he's, uh, if he's welding and he's using new welding techniques, maybe it has or it hasn't. But it's so minor compared to what the vision is. And compared to what, if he's excited about technology, then by God, that technology is important. And if he's not, it's not. And the technology, it's there to be an open door. It's there to remove obstacles. And so you're almost saying, uh, to what extent, you know, it, it's almost like uh, the first time they put roads across America and uh and got all the cattle off of them and then people say to what extent did cattle farms influence your drive across america you say well i didn't run into any cattle farms <laughs> there, there to what extent does technology I I influence you i i really didn't have a lot of technical problems today that's how it's influenced me. Although I've got to say, man, there have been weeks of technical problems. Well, I'm just thinking of, for instance, all of the voices that you'd have available now, you know, as opposed to the the, the 80s. Well, uh, in the 80s, it, uh, it's, the MIDI was really nice. It's just a matter of where you're aiming your creativity. I like composition more than I like tone, generally. Now, a good tone, you don't have to play very much. If you've got a really good tone, you can play one note on your guitar and that's it, you're done. Um, and Dave Govett taught me that. Because while I was concentrating on, on composing for Sound Canvas, even when other technologies were available, he was, was hawking his car and, and buying Miroslav sound libraries. And I said, man, that's just tones. That's just tones. And he says, yeah, well, you know, kind of sometimes uh, when you have good tones, the songs just kind of write themselves. And I'm like, okay, this guy's nuts. But with that attitude, he wrote some of the most beautiful, beautiful stuff I ever heard. And he also became an advisor for Miroslav. Uh, he also became, uh, he got to the point where Hans Zimmer would fly him out to help out with tones and electronic uh, orchestration. And he was the guest of the uh, Cirque du Soleil in uh, Las Vegas because he was helping them with their technology. So, you know, and he just made beautiful sounds. Uh, for me, if I'm composing for Survivor, which I'm making some music for Survivor, 
those big orchestral sounds are really important, but so is uh, the conch shell. <laughs> That'll wake you up. <laughs> See, you just squeeze it. Um, those things, you, you can't, even if you have a patch library, oh, here, I got something for you. Check this out. Okay, you think in your in your brain you're thinking, uh, if I have all these electronic patches, I'll be a great musician. But let me go get get something that I can't play at all. But let me show it to you. Okay, if you're looking for something that's got feel to it, never going to get uh, a patch library that will adjust itself to the feel i'm making i'm making tens of decisions every second you know i'm deciding how fast to move my finger i'm reacting to what i'm hearing i'm deciding how hard to pluck this i can do i can i can hit the instrument you 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 can buy sound libraries that have maybe one patch that's all hits, but all you're going to hear is this. It's going to be the same thing over and over, just like a bad game soundtrack. Look, here they come. Look, here they come. <laughs> <laughs> so by, uh, by getting involved in the instrument, you get, you're able to put in more love, care, and attention, uh, through the sounds, and there are long-standing ways to that established working ways to make sounds that are expressive, and they're they're tried and true, and they're still open for all kinds of experimentation, and they exist there regardless of patch libraries, and you can always record. There's always either tape recorder or multi-track recorder, um, old technology that allow you to record tunes like that. Where it becomes different these days is to what extent do you have software that allows you to be interactive in, inside the game. And that is uh, a dog's breakfast. It's just a mess. Um, and uh, it's, it may be a topic for another, uh, another get-together. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Next week, I should be back with a retrospective of The Legend of Grimrock. Really great game that I think you guys will enjoy. And after that, I'll follow up with my follow-up interview with George, uh, where he talks about Wing Commander and the 7th Guest, 11th Hour, and all of his excellent game sound checks. So, got a lot of great stuff coming up in the next few weeks. As always, I want to thank you very much if you have supported the show with a donation. It's very easy to set those up. You can uh, follow the links at the bottom of the show uh, notes, or you can go to armchairarcade.com and set up a PayPal subscription plan, and I will be very, very grateful to you indeed if you do that. Now, what about the Ale of the Week? Uh, this week, I have a really fun uh, selection. Uh, this is Hog Heaven. Uh, it's brewed by the um, Avery Avery Brewing Company in Boulder, Colorado. Now, apparently, this is the Holy Trinity of ales. It is. Uh, they got quite a bit of a quite a write up on the bottle here. Is it Hop Heaven? Uh, that's the question they asked. Dangerously drinkable Garnet Beauty, designed to satisfy the most zealous zealous <laughs> zealous <laughs> of hop devotees. Intense bitterness and the dankest of dry hopped aromas. Dankest? Is that a <laughs> something that you want in an ale? <laughs> it's actually good. Let's see what these. Uh, if there's an alcohol content here. Uh, 104 IBUs, uh, whatever that is. 9.2 percent 
alcohol by volumes are quite strong. Uh, maybe it will be <laughs> pretty intense. But anyway, let's get it open and uh, see what it smells like. You can definitely smell that hoppy. Definitely smell the hops. It's a very, uh, very nice smell. Uh, not, not overpowering. It doesn't look like I got a big uh, head on this either, so go ahead and give it a taste. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay. Kind of a creamy taste. You definitely taste that bitterness they were talking about. Not, not, not bitter enough to be unpleasant, though. I'm very happy to say. Actually, quite, quite good. I like this. It's uh, sort of got kind of a coffee, uh, coffee, a little nutty kind of taste there. It's uh, quite, quite nice. And you can imagine like some, uh, uh, some roasted peanuts and maybe, maybe been roasted a little bit too long and they're kind of uh, burnt a little bit. You know, you sort of get that kind of taste here. Actually quite nice though. I think you would en enjoy this, especially if you like, uh, you know, the hops and the sort of bitter um, ale selection. So quite nice. It wasn't what I was expecting uh, from a barley wine. Oh, usually those uh, seem to be sweeter than this. Uh, this isn't very sweet at all. It's you know, kind of dry and bitter. So if, <laughs> if that sounds good to you, uh, then get the uh, hog heaven. I think you'll like it. But anyway, let's uh, finish this show up with a quotation. And I found a really good and uh, apropos quotation from Bach. And it goes something like this. It's easy to play any musical instrument. All you have to do is touch the right key at the right time and the instrument will play itself. See you guys next week. Now this is an instance of a leaky flood film. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is kind of pretty. Mm -hmm. I think I'll keep it. Okay. Oh, it's beautiful. Mm.